So you're here with Paul Puckett. Um, Paul, if you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and what you do, how you got started in the uh, fly fishing industry. Go ahead and get yeah. going. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Paul Puckett. I'm from Dallas, Texas, originally, and um, I started really getting getting into fishing at a young age. Like the classic story of you know your granddad taking you fishing all the time and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And he was always fly fishing for bass as I was kind of throwing a plastic worm out there. So I was always intrigued by that that motion of throwing a fly rod and like I was always kind of under the spell of it. And uh, he told me he would teach me one day when I kind of mastered the regular fishing a little bit more and just so it wouldn't be too much to deal with it at such a young age. And just through him dying and passing on, it just never happened. So I just kind of grabbed his gear and started kind of learning on my own, pretty much like through middle school. I think I was around 13, 14, 15. And then uh, just just got really fascinated with fly fishing and all the different aspects that you're kind of intrigued by too, like the fly tying and, and how fish live in all these beautiful places and just kind of this mystical fantasy world of fly fishing. It can definitely grab you. And uh, when I graduated high school, my parents drove me out to Montana for kind of my senior summer graduation gift and we were in montana for about two weeks and i just couldn't get it out of my mind i just knew someday i wanted to live out west and i came back home and started working at a fly shop in dallas and and that started my kind of career in the industry uh which i worked at fly shops for 22 years and it was the best thing i've ever done to honestly help me be successful as an artist because i met so many people working in fly shops in Dallas, Texas, Jackson, Wyoming. I was out in Jackson for four years and then Atlanta and now Charleston. So working in fly shops in all those different areas, think of all the different people I've met that are in the fly fishing industry or oh, customers yeah. that I've met. Uh, so I definitely contribute a lot of that, my success uh, to that. And, and it's led me to Charleston, South Carolina now uh, where I, I've just, I, I'm addicted to saltwater. I love I love trout fishing too. Don't get me wrong, or freshwater bass, whatever. But uh, the mystique of saltwater fishing and the challenge of it uh, definitely intrigues me more than anything. Now that's why I just finally had to move to Charleston. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, like you said, you uh, you do art. What kind of got you started in um, like painting and not not know so much yeah. painting, but like wanting to do it and capture those moments and fly fishing on paper instead of just say like a picture or a, a camera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, growing up, I played baseball and my hobby was fishing with my buddies and I did a lot of creating growing up. Uh, my dad and I would always build model airplanes, model cars, and we'd paint them. And, you know, so I, I kind of grew up mimicking things my whole life and then when i started fishing more in high school i started i knew that i, I liked art and i knew that drawing and painting were fun i really enjoyed it and i kind of saw myself as maybe one day being a graphic designer artist where you can actually get a job make money being an artist so in uh not unlike your situation where your teacher's letting you do a story about anything you want my art teachers always let me paint and draw whatever i wanted so and that always ended up being some sort of fish or some sort of fishing scene um, and occasionally music. Like I remember doing paintings of like Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan, which I equally love music a lot, too. So those teachers that let you do your passions and let you do the things that you enjoy and not force into a corner of writing about some subject matter that you have no interest in uh, definitely weighs a lot. And people like your future because you'll always remember that. And I think it definitely uh, helps in being interested in something you love and have passion about. So I was lucky to have teachers that let me do whatever I wanted to, whenever I wanted. So, so um, because you do all these paintings and because you choose to do that, and instead of, you know, say taking a picture on your phone, what do you think that adds to like the moment per se? And, Cause you know, it would be a lot easier just to, you know, like go out there and take a picture, but like, instead of doing that, you're choosing to capture this beauty, like with a brush or with a pencil or a pen. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the times I don't really know that I'm taking photos at the time 
for the instance of actually painting them and using them as, as references later. I'll take a bunch of photos like on a trip and I'll come back and look at them. And if something catches my eye and really sells that moment to me and something that I can use. And, and a lot of times, a lot of my paintings, I'm using four different photos. Like I'll take a cloud skyline from one photo, put it in the backdrop of another photo that I liked if someone cast into a bonefish. And then I'll use a totally different water reference. So a lot of the times I'm creating that painting from just a puzzle of photos. But uh, yeah, there, in, in a lot of my drawings as well, like I think I'll definitely take a photo sometimes with the idea that I know that later on I want to draw that in my journal. Uh, so a lot of my journal drawings are definitely from the mindset of taking that photo in that particular moment, whereas paintings really come from an evolution of different photos that I might come back back to two years later. So and I'm not too organized, and uh, I'm I'm definitely a sloppy, messy person. So my organize, organization <laughs> skills of keeping photos kind of referenced like that need a lot yeah. of improvement. So. So what do you look for for inspiration when you start um, putting your image on a paper, like you said? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like right now, I've got three paintings I've got to do for a carpet tournament, the Don Holly tournament down in Florida, uh, which happens every first week of June. So I got to do three paintings for that, which are used for trophies. And, you know, I'm creeping up on the deadline about a month and a half away. So. Clearly, my inspiration for that is tarpon, like a tarpon, some sort of tarpon uh, idea. Now, I don't want just the typical boat with a tarpon jumping. I want something different and refreshing that typically hadn't been seen before. Like last year, I did a painting of a tarpon and a boat and a guide and the tarpon jumping, but I put it back in the 70s. I kind of wanted to go back and take a a trip back to 1971, let's say, where the guys are in a John boat and they don't have any like current modern gear on their boat. And it portrays the idea that in the seventies they did it without all that crap. And today, like we think that we have to have the latest and greatest engine, the whole, and we have to have the real and all this stuff where back in 1971, they were jumping 150 pound tarpon with, you know, a Seamaster reel and whatever rod and nothing in the boat, you know? So, I'm definitely trying to evoke some sort of emotion with the piece and I'm kind of right in the middle of creating ideas right now for those pieces. So inspiration can sometimes come from deadlines, which, yeah, uh -huh. uh, which is good for me because I, I procrastinate a lot. So, uh, but if I'm doing my own painting, it, it really is just an idea that might strike me in my head. And I sometimes don't have any idea where that uh, inspiration comes from. So, you know, it just depends. So uh, I'll leave you with uh, one last question here, Paul, and let you get going. Um, what's just one thing that you love most about fly fishing that you think just separates it compared to a uh, conventional? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's uh, I want to say brotherhood, but there's also women involved too. So uh, it's the camaraderie, I think, um, that everyone has kind of reached that level in angling where it's a hard sport and it's a hard thing to do. So once you kind of get in that, that mindset, I think the relationships that you create around that and going fishing with your buddies and, and hanging out, you know, on the side of the road after you fish. And sometimes you'll even talk about the day more than you actually fish. Like you might actually go out and just fish an hour, but you next thing you know, you've been hanging out by the car for two and a half hours talking about it. So, I think that camaraderie that we have and the, the hangout, hanging out with your buddies and, and just talking about all the stories and memories is, is honestly my favorite part of it. Like sometimes I could go fishing for four hours and not even pick up a rod and sit there and watch someone. So I think that has a lot to do with my love and joy of the sport for sure. All right. Well, thank you a lot, Paul. Thank you for your time and uh, your questions. Absolutely, man. If, if you feel like you've missed anything, don't uh, hesitate to holler. Absolutely. See you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, y'all. Appreciate it.